Often uh, we have a lot of Jewish names that incorporate Hashem's name in them. Uh, anything with the L, Yisrael, Daniel, uh, Gavriel, Rifael, and all of these are not just the same two letters. They actually refer to Hashem. So the question is, uh, you're not supposed to say Hashem's name in vain. Uh, so how are you allowed to uh, pronounce those names? Uh, the, the short answer is that once it becomes part of a name, even though it is an indirect reference to Hashem, it's now a reference to a person. So halakhically, you are allowed to, to do so. Interestingly enough, in writing these names, some people do have a chumrah that they will not write the last letter. You sometimes see they'll write Doniel, and they'll do like a, a da, you know, what, what do they call it? I'm forgetting my English. Uh, a diacritical mark, <laughs> that must be an easier word for it, at the end of the word instead of writing the last lamed. But that itself is also a chumrah. Uh, because the same svara that you are allowed to say it, you're allowed to write it, and you're allowed to erase it. It's because it's not considered to be erasing the, na the name of Hashem. Right? So that's uh, considered to be halachically permitted. Uh, yeah? Um, just off of that, how, why do we say haluka instead of... Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, that's a very good question. Now, uh, halaluka, uh, because praise, praise God, right? Uh, so according to some, it's actually considered to be two words. If you look in Tehillim, there's a machlokas if halaluka is written as one word or written as two words. Now, if it's written as two words, then essentially you're saying two words, praise God. Uh, so that would be the difference. But on the other hand, uh, like the opinion that says it's one word, so that's a very, very good question. Uh, I think, though, there may be a difference between um, a noun and a verb in the sense of, of grammar, meaning to say, when it's a name, so it's the name of a person. Halaluka, whether it's one word or two words, actually means praise Hashem. In other words, it's not serving as a name, it's serving as a verbal directive in which HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the object of the verb, so that would be a little, that would, might be a little different. But it's a good question. I have to think about that a little bit more. But I, but I will say that if it's two words, it's a Dover Pashat that it's going to be Yasser. And if you look uh, in the Gemara itself, the Gemara records that um, uh, Rav saw a Tehillim written by his uncle, Rabbi Chia. I don't know if I mentioned it in our shir in the, in the afternoon, that Rav Chia was, Rav's, was actually Rav's uncle. And he says the halaluka was written in two, two separate words. Although in our sedurim we print it as, print it as one. Uh, yeah. Last question the same thing. Um, shouldn't Davin for Ratzon Hashem, for example, that Shidduchim for Shidduchim the Beshadurah? Or should, should we be Davin what we think is best that a, a Shidduch should come as soon as possible? In other words, you, you, the question is should you pray for a Shidduch Beshad Tova or should you pray for a Shidduch as soon as possible? Yes, yes. Uh, well, that's a good question, uh, but I, I, I think that Shah Tova is always better, meaning uh, there is a concept that uh, Hashem wants us to pray for things. And the people ask, you know, you're not, I know you're not, you're not asking this question, but one of the big questions everybody always asks is, Hashem knows what's best for me, Hashem knows what's good for me, I don't know what's good for me, so why am I davening for anything? Uh, just let me just wait and Hashem will give me what's good for me and what's not good for me, He's not going to give me, right? So what's the point of, of davening a, at all, right? That's a famous, difficult problem uh, that is discussed a lot. And, you know, there are a lot of different approaches to it, but, but one of the approaches is that uh, the Gemara says that why did Hashem make the matriarchs barren? You know, such righteous women who didn't have children for so many years. The answer is he wanted their tefillahs. He wanted their tefillahs. And that's a very important you say. Imagine, you know, Sari didn't have children for so many years. Rachel didn't have children for so many years. So let's imagine Sarah would have said at some point when she's 85, she would have said, I have a Muna that whatever Hashem does is good. And I am a Kabel Hashem's Gezerah Biava. Such a righteous woman that as, as hard as it is for me not to have kids, I accept it with love. So people would look at Sarah and say, what a Tzadekis, what a righteous woman. But you know what Hashem would be doing? Hashem would be, Kaviyocha, would be pulling out his hair. He says, I made you infertile because I wanted you to daven. What are you telling me? You're not davening? In other words, sometimes 
Hashem will always do what's good for us, but sometimes the good that he's doing is so that we will daven. That's the good. It's not that it's good not to have children. In other words, Hashem made somebody infertile not because it's better for them not to have children. It's better for them to daven. In other words, as Rav Yerucham says, and again, it, it, it's obvious from the Gemara that that's the pshat. It's not the idea that I daven because I have needs. Because if the only problem is I have needs, I could say Hashem will take care of my needs. No, my need is to daven. Elamai, without a need, I wouldn't know that. So Hashem, so it's not that the davening is because of the need, it's the need is because of the davening. So by that I mean the following. So the MS is, we often don't know what's good for us, and we need to have a Kesher with Hashem, and, and therefore Hashem puts difficulties in our lives, whether it's infertility, whether it's a lack of, uh, you know, not having a Shidduch, uh, any type of difficulty. So we should turn to Him and say, I need your help, I want to be connected to you. However, when it comes to the specifics of things, it is better to leave a certain amount to Hashem. Meaning you say to Hashem, I'm lonely, I'm lacking, I need a shidduch, and, uh, but I then leave it to Hashem to kind of determine uh, the, best, the best time. In other words, I would differentiate between the, the action of davening to Hashem for what you need and being overly specific, as you know, I, I want it, you know, by the end of, uh, you know, the end of this man, uh, and preferably I would like a Tuesday night wedding. You know, uh, <laughs> you, you, you don't, you don't, I mean, some people have a sheet, to, some people do have a sheet to that davening, that Hashem will give you that Cadillac or whatever it would be. Uh, to me, that always sounds a little Christian. Some, if, you ever, if you ever hear the televangelist, they say, you ask God and he's going to give you that blue car that you saw in the showroom. And, and the truth is, there are, there are tzaddikim that actually have, have given that type of model. Whatever you want, you ask for. But I think, and based on the Chazinish uh, and, and the like, I think he says we have to have a little bit of a different view. Tefillah is about relationship. And tefillah is about turning to Hashem, about that I have needs. And, and you, are, you identify those needs, because that makes you be margish how much you need a Kaddish Baruch Hu. But the specifics you kind of leave to Hashem. You don't give Hashem a laundry list of exactly how it's supposed to be. So, I, so that's a long-winded answer to, I would go with the Shah Tova in the best way. And why does it seem like over time uh, there's like less gedolim in every generation? Even when during our times it may be that there's Baruch Hashem a lot of kids uh, learning in yeshiva. If, I don't know if that's true, but if it is true, why? Yeah, so the question was raised, why does it appear, uh, again, uh, that there are less gedolim in our generation than in the generations before? Uh, you know, the truth of the matter is, uh, there never were a lot of gedolim by definition. Uh, you know, you can't have a lot of gedolim. If there are a lot of gedolim, then they're not so special. They're not so, so unique. And uh, all of us, I mean, although you're young, I'm, su I'm surprised you already have that uh, cynicism. But even, you know, somebody my age already, you know, I sometimes fall into the trap. Oh, I remember the good old, just like people might say, the Chavitz Chaim, I remember the good old days when you had, you know, uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein, you know, Yako Kamenetsky, and what, what, what has happened to our generation. Uh, and in truth, there is a Yerida Sadoros in many, many ways. Um, but uh, the truth of the matter is, Baruch Hashem, in every generation, Hashem does give us very, very great gedolim. I mean, Chaim Kinevsky, we have a great gedolim in our generation. But if you're asking me why are there fewer gedolim, okay, I'm here, I'm going to get in trouble again. I mean, I mean par par part of it is the yeshiva system, as a matter of fact. I mean, this goes back to the old idea that uh, the yeshivas made a certain decision. And again, even though it may sound like I'm being very, very revolutionary, I'm essentially going to say over what Rav Shach was saying for many, many years. The yeshivas created a type of system which is not geared to producing gedolim. And that is, and ironically, that is the slow, fetching, eon, derech of learning, where you're not covering mesechtas, you're not covering ground, you're not uh, learning a lot of Gemara, uh, and as a result, even if you spend all of your time, you know, with this chakira and that chakira and that chakira, you're not really developing a solid, real knowledge of shas and poskim. And therefore, Rav Shach, and again, this is, this is not my chiddush, I mean, Rav Shach, 
who uh, was, of course, Rav Shach was the guttle of the Rosh Hashivas, felt he was fighting this war that he couldn't win. I mean, I remember reading, uh, you know, Rav Shach's letters were published in Svarim. So I'm reading a long letter about how the derech of learning in yeshivas is not right. And then I'm just reading along, and then I'm reading another letter, the derech of learning in yeshivas is not right. And I said, didn't I, just, didn't I just read that letter? Was there a printing mistake? And then I'm reading another letter, the derech of learning in yeshivas is not right. And I'm, little guy, he says, what's going on here? Then I realized he wrote, you know, 20, 30 letters about this. Uh, that's exactly the point. He kept on writing about it over and over and over and over again. So as a result, you can have the paradox of someone who is learning in yeshiva for many, many years and really doesn't know a lot. Doesn't know a lot, even though they learn and even though... You know, there's a mitzvah to learn, even if you don't know what you're learning, you know, just to learn, and you know, that, that itself is a great mitzvah, but it's not going to produce a big, big Talmud Chacham. An example, uh, Rav Avati Yosef writes, and I heard this, and, and I remember there are literature Rosh Hashivas who also say this, so I don't remember the, which one I heard it on, that in, uh, when they were learning Yuvamos in a certain Zaman, from, from Sukkot to Pesach, they finished the Masechta, and they chazered the Masechta 50 times. 50 times. Can you imagine what it's like? I mean, okay, okay, because I'll talk about 101 times. Okay, granted. But can you imagine what it's like to learn over a Gemara, a complicated Gemara, 50 times? How much you'll remember, how much clarity you're going to have? But that's not encouraged, frankly, uh, in the yeshiva world, because all of us want to be Rav Chaim Soloveitchik without remembering that Rav Chaim Soloveitchik himself said, that any pilpul that does not involve knowing all of Shas is going to be a false pilpul. So, uh, therefore, although Baruch Hashem, uh, one thing I have to say, there are more people in learning now <coughs> than there, there ever was, actually. Uh, in other words, when, when you think about the great generation of Europe before the war, <coughs> the great yeshivas of Mir and Slobodka and Kamenetz, if you add up all of the numbers of all of the people in the in big yeshivas, Maybe you had 10,000 people, maybe. Maybe you had much even less than that. And today, you know, just the mere yeshiva alone, you have uh, 8,000 people, and then Lakewood, 8,000 people, and, and all the other yeshivas. So, in some level, Hashem has done a chesed to us to open up the gates of learning in a very, very wide way. But the derech of learning is not so calculated to produce a real, real Talmud Chacham. But nevertheless, there are people who buck the system. There are people who manage. In fact, even used that lesson. They manage to become great Talmud Chachamim, uh, even with the limitations of the yeshiva system. And uh, there will always be Gedolim. Hashem will not abandon Am Yisrael. This is the saying of a Pasuk. Loi Alman Yisrael. Yisrael will not be widowed. It will not be bereft of the leadership that, that, that it needs. Now, the other thing, too, is that you have to understand that the ruchnius of the world does get affected by society as a whole. That even if somebody's in kolel, even if somebody's in yeshiva, even if somebody's learning, if we live in a world that's progressively more materialistic, more sensual, more hedonistic, that's kind of a negative force that drags all of us down a little bit. And therefore, by definition, the avir of instant gra- the, the atmosphere of instant gratification uh, and unbridled hedonism that is so prevalent in the world is, is going to affect us spiritually in ways as well. So that might be another reason why we have that situation. Yeah. <clears throat> why is Tchiyas seem such a major tenet of Judaism to the point that if someone doesn't believe in it, they don't have a portion in Olam Haba? And on that note, are the 13 principles of faith de Raisa or, or not? Yeah, so let, let, me, let me take the, the second question first. Now, what is the status of the so-called 13 principles of, of faith? Uh, the 13 principles of faith uh, are taken really from the Hakdama, the introduction that the Rambam wrote to the uh, last parak of Sanhedrin. Right? The last, this is in the parish of Mishnayis. The last parak of Sanhedrin talks about uh, which Jews get Olam Haba and which Jews do not get Olam Haba. Right? Uh, it's all Agadita, a very important Agadita. And uh, the Rambam uses this as an excuse to talk about what must the Jew believe in. And he articulated 13 principles of faith. By the way, 
the Ani Mamin, at the end of Chakras, this Ani Mamin, that is not the Lushan of the Rambam. That was written by an anonymous person, we don't know who wrote it, based on the Rambam's formulations. If you want to see the actual language of the Rambam in terms of the 13 principles of faith, you have to look at the Parish of Mishnayas to Sanhedrin uh, to Perek Chelek. That's the, the 11th Perek. And the Rambam gives it was the 10th Perek and the like. Now, th what is the meaning of the 13 principles of faith? So the Rambam basically says that in order for a Jew to go to Olam Haba, he has to believe in these principles. So if I believe in these principles, then even if I violate Shabbos and I do all sorts of Averos, uh, I'll get punished for it, but I'm still Shayach to, to Olam Haba. So you're asking me, are they do raisa, are they not do raisa? That, that's a difficult question. According to the Rambam, they certainly would be do raisa, <laughs> because the Rambam basically says, if one does not believe in them, one is not a follower of the Jewish religion. One is not subscribing to the Jewish religion. However, I have to say that there are Rishonim that are cholek on some of the Yud Gimel Ikre Yamuna. For example, Rav Yasef Albo, who was a great uh, Jewish religious philosopher in the generations after the Rambam, actually argued there are not 13 principles of faith that a Jew must believe in. There's only three principles of faith a Jew must believe in. A Jew must believe in one God. A Jew must believe in a system of reward and punishment. And a Jew must believe that the Torah comes from Hashem and was not man-made. Now, everything else, Rav Albo says, are not called roots. They're not called ikar. They are called anaf. They are called branches. Now, let me give you two examples of how Rav Albo and the Rambam would differ. Let's take Mashiach. Let's say, um, which is, uh, or, 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 or let's say a person says, <coughs> I believe when a person dies, their soul goes to Hashem, and Hashem rewards the good, punishes the evil, but I don't believe in a physical Mashiach that's going to come back to earth, and I don't believe that the body is going to be resurrected, because, no, that's not important. The only important thing is the Nishama. So what would you characterize such a person? So according to the Rambam, such a person is a heretic, such a person is an apikairis, because he is denying both the Iker of Mashiach and the Iker of Tichiyas HaMesim. Rivaldo would say, well, wait a second here. It's true that he's denying Mashiach and Tichiyas HaMesim, but he does acknowledge there is a system of divine reward and punishment. So he's only making a mistake in a detail. Now again, people misunderstand Rav Albo. Some people say, oh, Rav Yosef Albo didn't believe in Tzachiyah Samesim. Or Rav Yosef Albo didn't believe in a uh, human Mashiach. That's not Emes. Rav Yosef Albo believed in the very, sa very th same things the Rambam believed in. But it's a question of classification. Is it an Iker? Or is it an Anaf? Is it a root? Or is it a branch? Because if it's a root, you're missing a root, you're cutting yourself off from Am Yisrael. You're missing a branch, you're making a mistake. This is very important. People misunderstand what Rav Albo was doing. He is not arguing in substance on the Rambam. He is arguing in classification on the Rambam. Now, I'll give you another example of something even more dramatic. Uh, the Rambam says, as one of the Ikarim, Hashem does not have a body. Hashem is not physical in any way. If you believe Hashem is physical, you are an apikoros, you are a kofer, etc. Rav Albo would say, well, uh, what if I believe, I believe there's one God, and I believe God can, I can have a body if he wants. I mean, in some ways, this is an interesting conundrum a little bit, you can raise it with, with Rabbi Gottlieb, uh, you know, uh, the idea that God cannot have a body, hmm, that's a little contradictory. Can't God do anything? I mean, if God wanted to have a body, why couldn't he have a body? Is the Rambam saying, Hashem can't do this? It's like, that's the old question, could God commit suicide? You know, the, it, it, there's a whole bunch of questions as to what limitations there are on the nature of divinity. So Rivaldo actually says, if somebody were to believe that God has a body, as long as he believes in the unity of Hashem, he's making a mistake. But he's not an apikoros, he believes in God. And in fact, the Ravid says the same thing. When the Rambam writes in the Mishnah Torah that God does not have a body, so the Ravid, in his very acerbic, sarcastic way, <laughs> says, a lot of people better than him, you know, thought that God did have a body. Because, you know, after all, the language of Tanakh, 
Right, language of Tanakh is very anthropomorphic. The hand of God, you know, mm -hmm. etc. You know, uh, the Lushan, uh, so the Rambam says, of course, over and over again, that's a mashal, that's a parable, it's not to be understood literally. But the Ravid says there were people. Now, the Ravid himself didn't agree with that, but the Ravid said there were good people who thought God had a hand and God had a head and God had an eye and everything else. So they're not going to be apikorsim. Again, that's Mamish Raval Boshita. Okay, so, so number one, therefore, the concept that all of the Ikra Madaraisa certainly cannot be true if, according to Ravalbo, you're not Mechayiv to believe all of those things. Okay, that, that's one thing. Um, now, when it comes to Tchiyas Amesim, though, you actually have a very, very strong Kasha, which is Badafka, a Kasha on the Rambam's definition of Tchiyas Amesim. Mm -hmm. By the way, the Rambam himself was accused of not believing in physical resurrection of the dead, <laughs> even though it's one of his. It's his 13th Ikara. Because in Hilchos Tshuva, when the Rambam discusses the ultimate reward for mitzvahs, he only discusses Olam Haba, where the Neshama goes. He does not talk about resurrection of the dead. And he was accused of not believing in resurrection of the dead. And the Rambam wrote a letter defending himself against the accusation. And this is called... Mamar, it was written in Arabic, but it was translated into Hebrew, Mamar Tchiyas Amesim, an essay on resurrection of the dead. And what the Rambam said in that uh, Igeris is really very, 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 very a little bit strange. The Rambam says, of course I believe in Tchiyas Amesim. But Tchiyas Amesim is not the end point. All that means is Hashem is going to do a miracle. He's going to put the bodies back into the soul so we see that God is the master of everything. And then those people are going to die. And that'll be the end of it. And the only eternal reward <coughs> is Olam Haba. In other words, according to Rambam, Dechia Samesim is not an end stage. Dechia Samesim is just a thing Hashem is going to do. <coughs> and then they'll die again. And they won't come back to life. And the, eter the eternity of life is only the neshama and not the guf. Now, I, I want to point out that that is a das yochid gomor, that everybody else, Ramban, uh, certainly the Mekubalim, and the Ramchal, and the Derech Hashem, they all understand that Tchiyas HaMesim is the ultimate return to Gan Eden, meaning we have this split between body and soul, with resurrection of the dead, the idea is Olam Haba comes into Olam Hazeh. And we, we have completed a 360 degree circle, exactly where we were before the Chait, the perfect world, the rectified world. So your Kasha, actually I'm, I'm making your question much stronger. So if you understood Techiyah Samesim, like Ramban, like Ramchal, then you can actually see why it's so important, because it really represents the ultimate perfection of a fragmented world, bringing us back to the world that Hashem wanted. But where you have a kasha is, bedafka like the Rambam. Why is it so important? Since, according to the Rambam, it isn't that. According to the Rambam, it is only this one-time miracle so why is it more important than Kriyas Yamsuf? I mean, why don't you put, uh, as an Iker Emuna, a Jew must believe in the splitting of the Red Sea or there will not be chorus. I mean, it's a miracle, like any other miracle. In fact, the Rambam even says, that's why I didn't talk about it in Hilchah's Tshuva as the ultimate reward for mitzvahs, because it's not. So again, this is a very long-winded way of saying you have a good kasha, and uh, I don't have an answer. But, uh, but what is intriguing about, what I, about, about this is that it's bedavka akasha, the way the Rambam understands Tchiyas HaMesim. And it would not be akasha the way the other Rishayim understand Tchiyas HaMesim. Yeah? Um, regarding the skin color and even other attributes of Ashkenazi Jews today, yeah. how do we understand um, this? Because, I mean, seemingly... I mean, I, I mean, I'm still not the exact location of where Abraham was, but it, it seems that it's a Seamass land. Yeah. Um, and and we see people from that uh, area have uh, darker, darker skin, and today we see uh, Ashkenazi Jews there. Maybe. Right, right. That, that, yeah, that's a very, very interesting question. The question is that uh, typical, typically Ashkenazi Jews, European Jews. 
uh, of light, light complexion, light eyes. Uh, that does not seem to be the indigenous uh, features of uh, people from the Middle East or Mesopotamia or wherever Avraham Avinu came from. So the question is, how did Ashkenazim, uh, how, you know, if they're descended from Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, uh, how did they have all of these uh, features and the like? So uh, it, it is a very good question. Uh, the, the short answer that's generally given is that Ashkenazi Jews uh, had a great deal of converts coming in. And there was a theory. I, I don't want to pass this off as uh, scientific truth because it's a very, very contested theory. And some say it's been discredited. But there was a theory that the majority of Ashkenazi Jews are descended from the Khazars. Now, if you remember the Khazars, the Kuzari, the, what is the Kuzari based on? The Kuzari, the famous book of Rav Yudah Halevi, uh, was fictional in the sense that he constructed a dialogue in order to teach Jewish philosophy, but it was based on a historical story. And the historical story was that in the 900s, a real long time ago, there was this nation in Russia in which the king kind of made his nation convert to Judaism. These are called the Khazars, so Kuzari comes from that. And uh, the theory was that this was such a large group that kind of intermarried. I mean, they were Gayrim that intermarried with the Jewish people. Uh, and as a result, that is how uh, Ashkenazi Jews acquired Caucasian features through the Khazar blood. Now, again, I, I don't want to pass this off as definitive truth. As they say, it's a very controversial theory. Uh, in fact, some anti-Semites even say that, hey, you know, Jews aren't so smart as the Khazars that are smart. Well, whatever they say. <laughs> the high IQ of Ashkenazi Jews is from the Khazars. It's not from, uh, it's not from the Jews at all. But okay, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, but, but be it as it may, even if you don't accept the Khazar theory, uh, we do have Gerim. Unfortunately, we have, other, we have things that are worse than Gerim. I mean, Gerim is good, but we have things like rape. We, we have all sorts of other things in the course of the years. Uh, that kind of infiltrated the Jewish uh, bloodlines. And as a result, uh, we have uh, complexions that are not consistent with the place of origin that we came from. Yeah. Um, next part of the question is about the and It talks about the um, uh, slavery in, in, in those times. So I wanted to know specifically in regards to, um, not Abed Ibri, but Abed uh, Shani, um, the, way that, the way that the Torah Yeah. So I want to know um, how do we reconcile, like, I guess, how slavery seems very um, obscure to most of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a, a, a perennial issue that, that people grapple with all the time. Uh, all of us live with a sensibility that we absorbed as children. Uh, that slavery is something that is immoral, slavery is something that is degrading, it's, it's uh, destructive of, of morality and ethics, uh, right? The Civil War was, was fought, the U.S. Civil War was fought over slavery and uh, whatever it will be. And yet we look at the Torah and the Torah <coughs> legitimates slavery. Now, uh, you're correctly noting that Evid Ivry is actually not really slavery. Evid Ivry, if you look at the laws that pertain to an Evid Ivry, Essentially, it's uh, what would be called um, a way of a poor person uh, kind of hiring himself out uh, and be given his support. And even if it's a punishment for theft, if you steal and you don't have what to pay, but still the slavery, the slavery, so to speak, is very, very benign. Uh, and uh, a master, right? <coughs> what is the Gemara's lesson? <coughs> if you acquire an Evid Ivory, you've acquired a master. If you only have one pillow, the Ebed gets the pillow. The Ebed gets the best food. So in spite of the use of the term Ebed, we would not call that slavery in any sense. But Ebed Kanani, on the other hand, non-Jewish servitude, uh, certainly does uh, contain <coughs> the aspects of slavery. Uh, the slave is inherited, uh, passed down. The slave is not supposed to be freed in any way. Uh, the slave cannot be tortured. That much we do have. So it's a little, it is better than slavery uh, of, the, of the blacks in the South. Uh, but nevertheless, the slave can be forced to do whatever work you want him to do. So the question is, how do we understand the morality of, of slavery? Uh, why would the Torah permit such an institution? So there are a few different approaches that, that, that people have. One approach that is suggested is, but I'll, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a kasha on that in a moment, 
is that the Torah tolerated and permitted institutions that were very common in the ancient world, but it never wanted those institutions to become permanent. Uh, an example that's given for that is korbanos. The Rambam says by korbanos that really Hashem doesn't want korbanos. But the Jews were so connected to idolatrous offerings that Hashem couldn't take them off at cold turkey. So we had to give them away to serve Hashem. In other words, Hashem tolerates korbanos, but not that Hashem wanted korbanos. That's the Rambam. Now, the Ramban attacks that, but okay, that's the Rambam. So some want to say that maybe slavery is the same way. Everybody was having slaves. Everybody was doing it. Every nation was doing it. Most nations were doing it in a much more barbaric way. So the Torah tolerates an institution and then tries to humanize it, tries to moralize it, but it leaves room for society to progress. Although we regress on so many levels, but on some level, we can progress and get rid of it. Now, I'll tell you my kasha on that. I mean, I, I, I like that. I like that a lot. But my kasha is, if that would be the case, then why would it be prohibited to free your Eben? The Gemara actually says you're not allowed to free your Eben. Um, remember, the Gemara is a famous case. Rabbi Eliezer came to Shul with his Eben Kanani. And uh, there was only nine people. Uh, with the Eben would have been the tenth. He freed his Eben. That's a big loss of a financial resource. He freed his $100,000 Eben, whatever it is, to make a minion. And the Gemara asks, how could he do it? You're not allowed to free your slave. And the answer is, for a mitzvah or a mitzvah involving a tzibor, it was permitted. Now, it seems to me that if you're basically saying the Torah tolerates slavery, but it was never a desirable thing, then fakert. If I want to free my slave, kadesh, right? I ought to be credited for it, right? Just like uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, of course, he didn't free his slaves in his lifetime, but he left in his will that when he dies, his slaves should be free. <laughs> he left, he left, of course, some of the slaves were his own kids, but okay. Uh, and, 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 and the like. So that's an approach, but I, I think you have a kasha from the din of Kolom Meshachar Avda Eber B'Yasei. Now, the Nitziv has another approach, which is not politically correct. Uh, so, you know, you, you tell this to somebody who's not from, you know, they're going to not accept it. But the Nitziv says that the institution of Evid Kanaini was a way of civilizing people who were very, very savage. I mean, the, the non-Jew was a pagan in Ovid Avodazara, a Rotseach, a Goslan, had no semblance of moral behavior. He becomes a, an Evid Kanaini in a Jewish home. So he's chayev in mitzvos, like a woman. He has to keep Shabbos and the like. He can learn from uh, religious people. Uh, and the idea would be that this is one of the ways that pagans, we, we don't force them to become Jewish per se, but, uh, but by forcing them into a slavery mode at least, there is a concept in which they can be influenced for the better. And therefore it is a tayeles for them to live a life of ruchnius given the utter corruption and degradation of the society that they came from. And enochinami, uh, let me point out, that the rule that if you knock the tooth or the eye of the Evet out, he goes free. So one way of generalizing it is, it's telling the master, you better not physically abuse your Evet or you might lose him. I mean, you can actually look at it as the Tyra protecting the bodily integrity of the Evet by saying that if you abuse your Evet, ad kach, that he, that he loses uh, an organ or loses an Ever, uh, you will lose the Evet, Legamri. Okay? So those are kind of the two approaches. Approach number one is the Torah tolerates but never encourages. Approach number two is this was a mechanism to civilize the immoral, uh, evil behaviors of, of the Ovde, of the Ovde of Avayda Zara uh, and, uh, and like. By the way, in the American Civil War, uh, or before the American Civil War, when uh, you had the abolitionist movement in the United States, which was the, the people that were urging uh, slaves to be free. So there was an argument among rabbis. Uh, there were rabbis who gave sermons. Uh, one rabbi uh, gave a whole sermon that slavery is perfectly fine uh, because, you know, the Torah allows slavery. So who are you to speak out against it? Other rabbis said, you know, the Torah wants liberty. The Torah wants freedom. Interestingly enough, uh, the rabbi that gave the slavery speech happened to be an Orthodox rabbi. There weren't that many Orthodox rabbis in America. 
uh, and the one that calls for freedom was a reform rabbi. Okay, I I interesting uh, issue. I'm a little, little embarrassed about that. Uh, but still, as I say, if you simply look at the Pshuto Shel Mikra, uh, slavery seems to be endorsed, so you have to give Terutzim. Now, one other final thing I want to mention a little bit, and that is uh, the discussion so far had nothing to do with blacks or not blacks, right? just slavery in general. The question is, is there something significant uh, about uh, blacks being slaves? Uh, there are those, now this is a big controversial hot button issue uh, because it all goes back to Noah, right? Noah cursed his son Cham and he said to Cham that you will be a slave uh, to your brothers because Cham revealed Noah's nakedness. Now, there are some, in fact, this was the, the rabbi who gave his speech <laughs> against the abolitionists. There are some that interpret that as a curse of blackness, and God decreed that blacks would be slaves. Now, I, I want to point out, again, I, I feel embarrassed to, to say this, I want to point out right away that uh, that is not the mainstream view of Chazal, because the truth of the matter is the black descendant of Noah was not Cham, it was Cush. Cush was Cham's son. Cham himself, uh, Africa, was black, and uh, it doesn't say that blackness is necessarily a reason for cursing. So many, many learn that that was a distortion. The people who use that medrash to justify racial slavery uh, are incorrect. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, we, don't, uh, we wouldn't follow that view. But as I say, Abed Kanani doesn't depend on race. Uh, Abed Kanani depends on Jewish versus, versus not Jewish. And those would be the two defenses that we would give for Abed Kanani. Yes. I'm just a bit confused with the Abed Kanani. So why not just make him be, uh, be given the business of Ben Noah? Why bring him all the way to him? So can I show <coughs> his status and his essence? We're giving him, we don't proselytize, but in the day we're almost making him in the way that yeah, 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 yeah. So, so let me explain something about Evid Kanani that I think sometimes people don't get. Uh, everyone knows this idea that an Evid Kanani, Kanani is loved after, it means a non-Jewish slave, has the same mitzvos as a woman. Which means actually a shifra Kanainis is identical to a Jewish woman, uh, whatever it would be. Now, what happens when the Evid is freed? When the Evid is freed, the Evid is a full Jew. An Eved Meshuchrar is like a gear at that point. So people raise the question, gee, does that mean that essentially somebody's being forced into being a Jew? Because the slavery state was certainly involuntary. You captured him in war, whatever it is. And that makes him Eved Kanani. And then whenever you decide to free him for whatever reason, he becomes a Jew whether he likes it or not. Nobody asked him. So the MS is, if you look in the Rambam, Hilchus Avadim, you actually see a very, very interesting thing. It's not as simple as you would imagine. And that is, when I buy a non-Jewish slave or I take a captive in war, he's my Evet, he's my property, and I can sell him and I can make money, etc. But in order for him to have the halachos of an Evet Kanani, Chayev and Mitzvos, he has to go to the mikveh and have a bris. And he has to do that voluntarily. I cannot force him to become an Evid Kanani. Now, the Rambam says, I have 12 months in which I could try to convince him to go to the mikveh and have a bris. If at the end of the 12 months he refuses, I'm not allowed to keep him. I'm not allowed to keep a non-Jewish slave who didn't become an Evid Kanani, but he doesn't go free. I can sell him to a guy. Etc. So people don't realize that the conversion aspect of an Evid Kanani actually has to be volitional, but that's only part one. The becoming a full Jew when I free him, that doesn't depend on his ratzon. Because I, I can free him against his will, then he's a Jew whether he likes it or not. But at least the initiation came in there. Now that doesn't fully answer your question. In other words, because what, what the Rambam is telling me is, I as a Jewish slave owner have only one option. Either I get my Eved to become quasi-Jewish, or I gotta let him, you know, I gotta sell him. Why can't we allow a, a Noahide situation? So some have said that uh, maybe it's a bad, you know, I mean, at this point we're just speculating that um, 
we don't want Jewish families to be exposed to a, a, a real non-Jewish presence in the house, like a Shabbos guy or whatever it would be. We want someone that is kind of living the life of a Jew because the Ebed is in your home all the time. Again, I mean, I, I don't know how strong that reason it is. I mean, people have live-in babysitters. I mean, people have all sorts of, I mean, certainly in Chutz, well, here in Eretz Yisrael, Filipinos, etc. I mean, uh, there's all sorts of non-Jews that are inhabiting uh, Jewish homes, and we don't necessarily say they have to uh, be Evid Kanani. By the way, a final point. Do you know that an Evid Kanani theoretically can exist even today? Even today. Uh, it's against the law. You would get in trouble for owning a slave. Uh, but it can happen. And this is a little complicated, but based on a mission in Kedushin, it is potentially a solution for a very serious problem, the problem of mamzer, right? We know, for example, that if a person <coughs> was born from a second marriage and their mother never got a get from the first marriage, potentially, potentially, the child might be a mamzer who cannot marry into Klal Yisrael. A mamzer can only marry a mamzeret, or a mamzer can marry a gioras, and either way, the child is a mamzer. It goes on forever. And when it says the 10th generation, that's Lavdafka, it's forever. So what can a mamzer do? A mamzer is a Jew, but, but what can he do about his children? So Rav Tarfon said, ah, oh, I got you a great solution. If a mamzer marry, a mamzer is allowed to marry a shifcha kenainis. And if a mamzer marries a shifcha kenainis, the child is an eved kenani, because the child of a shifcha is an eved. If I then free the eved kenani, he's like a ger. And as a ger, he cuts off any prior stigma that he had. And at that point, he's a ger. He's not a mamzer. He can marry anybody he wants. Now, this only works if you have a male mamzer. If you have a female mamzeret, this is not going to work for her, because even if she marries an eved, the child is after her, might make your lineal descent. So, some have suggested that if, God forbid, somebody finds themselves in the position of mamzer, they, it's a little difficult to know how to present this uh, to someone you're dating, uh, but you date a non-Jew, but not a non-Jew, and you talk to the non-Jew, listen, I have something I need to talk to you about. Uh, would, you, would you be my slave? <laughs> now, this doesn't mean, you know, I'm going to do anything, you know, like slavery stuff. But, you know, you go to the mikvah, you accept, the truth is, shifcha kenani, you accept the mitzvah, spetairas evet kenani, and then we have children, and our children are not mamzerim. And then, when you reach menopause, and there's no longer going to be, you see, let me explain this. Uh, he can't free her, because as soon as he frees her, she's like a gioris. A mamzer who marries a gioris, the kids are still mamzerim. So that means for all of her childbearing years, she has to remain a slave. But uh, when she reaches menopause and no longer has children, he can then free her. Now this may sound very bizarre, but this is a, a serious uh, solution that some people have advocated to uh, get rid of the stigma of mamzer. Now, in truth, if a mamzer would marry a non-Jewish woman, Legamre, that would also get rid of mamzer because a mamzer marries a non-Jewish woman, the kid's a goy, he converts, he's not a mamzer. But the problem is, a mamzer is not allowed to marry a non-Jew. A mamzer is allowed to marry a shifcha. So marrying a shifcha is actually an eifin that's mutter. Marrying a non-Jew is obviously uh, an eifin that's usher. But the only thing is, if a mamzer lives with a shifcha, there's no kedushin, so it's a strange thing. They're essentially uh, living out of wedlock. I mean, there's not, there's not going to be a chasna, you know. Uh, and yet, uh, a mamzer is allowed to do that. So, paradoxically, as I say, Evid Kanaini is even shayach, even shayach bisman hazeh. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Oh, that's a very good question. How is he allowed to free her? How is he allowed to free his children? I mean, even, even, yeah. Because you're not allowed to be Meshach or Abzai. So, Lagabe freeing the children, it says, in order to, uh, just as the Gemara said, Letzarich Mitzvah, Rabbi Elezer could be Meshach or his Evet, uh, to Mitzvah from Leminyan. So, in order to be Metahir, my children, from the stigma of Mamzerus, it would be permitted for me to be Meshachar them, but that would not, that would not be a heter for the, to be Meshachar the woman, only, only the children. It's a good kasha. It could be, it could be, it's not so plush that he could be Meshachar, Meshachar her under those conditions. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, 
in many times in Jewish history that Jews, many Jews have assimilated and even after so many generations have forgotten that they're even Jewish. Like I've heard that like one fourth of everybody in Spain is of Jewish ancestry. And I guess of them, there's a certain percentage that's direct maternal line. Even some people say like Elvis Presley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's correct, yeah. So like, it would seem that there are, I don't, are these people considered Jewish? And if they are, wouldn't that mean that there are more Jews that don't know they're Jewish? And, or are they not considered Jewish? And what is, because there's many mitzvot and things where there's like a collective responsibility for the Jewish people. Like, and then people also make uh, things about how when the Mashiach comes, there has to be so many Jews. <coughs> for the Mashiach to come, there has to be so many Jews that are, that are keeping Shabbos. I've heard this before. Like, how is that even possible? Like, yeah. are the, so that's basically... Well, the basic idea is that uh, a Jew is a Jew uh, even, even if they don't know they're a Jew. A Jew is a Jew even if they practice Christianity, even if they deny uh, everything in the Torah. There may be a sinful Jew, there may be an apostate Jew, or there may be a Jew who simply doesn't know, and they're not necessarily at fault, but you cannot uh, get rid of your Judaism, right? Uh, a Jew is a Jew no matter what. So that would mean that I, you cannot say definitively that uh, the descendants of the uh, Jews in Spain are still Jewish because there could have been intermarriage with non-Jewish women, uh, but certainly it could, con it could constitute at least a suffix. And that means there could be many, many, many more Jews uh, than we think exist in the, in the world. Uh, there is a, a belief that the Pashtun tribe of Afghanistan which is the largest tribe of Afghanistan, 30 million people. At least some of them might be Jewish. They might be descended from the lost 10 tribes uh, because they have some very crazy things. Uh, they're Islam. They're, they, they pra they're, they're Muslims. They're not, they're not, they don't practice Judaism, obviously. But they fast on Yom Kippur, and they do circumcision on the eighth day, which is not, uh, Islam uh, does circumcision, but not on the eighth day. So where did they get that? You know, so there's some suspicion. Uh, and, and, and the like. Now, those are kind of situations where just assimilation and intermarriage happens and you know, people don't even know that they're Jewish. But let me mention a related problem, which is not the same thing, but it's a little bit related. Uh, during the course of the Christian persecutions, like the Crusades, there were a number of Jews who sometimes converted to Christianity because of fear of death or, or whatever it would be. There were other Jews, not that many, Baruch Hashem, who converted simply for monetary gain. Uh, just, you know, whatever it is. They wanted professional positions or whatever, whatever it would be. In fact, uh, some of the greatest Rishonim, the greatest Rishonim, I'm not going to mention the name because of Lashon Hara, uh, had children who converted to Christianity. And it was discussed already in the time of the Rishonim during the Crusades, <coughs> what is the reentry procedure? if a Jew who converted to Christianity wants to rejoin Judaism. And halachically, a conversion is not necessary. There's no reason to have a conversion. But pragmatically and emotionally, many of the Rishayim enacted a conversion procedure. Because breaking away from the Jewish religion is such a serious thing that we're not going to let you in for free. You've got to go to the mikveh. You've got to fast. You've got to accept certain penances. So as a result, there is what you might call a, uh, an unofficial reconversion procedure for Jews who had repudiated uh, Judaism. Now, this is an interesting example where the halacha is actually more lenient than the Israeli government's law of return. You know, the law of return, which is a secular law, it's not, it's not a religious law, was the very first law passed by the state of Israel in 1948. And the law of return says that every Jew defined as somebody born from a Jewish mother or having a halachic conversion, at least that was the original wording of the law, has automatic citizenship, or has the right to automatic citizenship in the state of Israel. Okay, law of return. So in the 19, I don't know if it was the 50s or the 60s, there was a famous case called the Brother Daniel case. Brother Daniel was a Jew born from a Jewish mother who converted to Christianity. He became a priest but he wanted to live in Israel. So he claimed automatic citizenship under the law of return. Now, as a matter of halacha, it's a Dover Pashid, he's a Jew. 
He is a Jew. But the Israeli Supreme Court said, uh, somehow, I, mean, I don't know why they were so machmer in this, they said, a Jew who turns away from Judaism to embrace another religion is not considered a Jew for purposes of the law of return. So this is a very interesting example that a totally secular uh, court that was hostile to Yiddishkeit and Torah anyway, all of a sudden they're so machmer, you convert to Christianity, you're not one of us. A posek would say, you're a Jew, of course you're a Jew, no matter what. Uh, and you see this actually, you see this even in the United States, a similar thing, that there's a visceral disgust for someone who embraces Christianity. I mean, on one hand, you can have a Jew who doesn't keep Shabbos, doesn't keep kosher, doesn't have it, doesn't do anything, but he will not allow a Jew for Jesus, a Messianic Jew, to come within his four amos. It's an interesting issue of why, why is that there, why is there that emotional reaction. Uh, but you see it in the Brother Daniel case, that if a Jew is totally not religious, he certainly qualifies for Aliyah under the Law of Return. That's a Dover Pashat. <laughs> People make Aliyah all the time uh, who are not religious. But if you convert it to Christianity, you know, that's, uh, you will not, you're not a Jew in the eyes of... Again, I'm, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying it's an interesting anomaly that uh, people have much more of a visceral negative reaction towards that than somebody who is simply uh, not religious. On the other hand, let me point out that the Rambam has a letter. It's a fascinating letter. What is worse, atheism or idolatry? Right? Idolatry is a real big sin. Obviously it is. About the Zara. What about an atheist? So interestingly enough, from the technical standpoint of halacha, you know, atheism is not a capital crime. If in the time of the Mikdash, if I bowed down to an idol and I was given warning, I could be executed. Even though that was rare, obviously, but I could be executed. <laughs> if I'm simply an atheist, I don't believe in God, there's no punishment for that, per se. And yet the Rambam writes, this is a fascinating teaching, the Rambam writes that atheism is worse than Avodhisara. Because at least with Avodah Zarah, I acknowledge there is a, an authority above me. And keep in mind as well that much Avodah Zarah acknowledged a supreme God. But they just felt that God was acting through these intermediary forces. An atheist says, there's nothing above me. I'm the highest level. So it's interesting that in the Rambam's hierarchy, uh, a denial of God was worse than even idolatry. And yet, in contemporary sensibilities, we have no problem with the Apicaris, but we have a real, real problem with the Messianic Jew. It, 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 I'm just thinking out loud. It's a reversal of the Rambam's hierarchy of, of, what, is, of what is worse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we know uh, the Gemara tells us, I'll, I'll start with the second thing he said. Uh, the Gemara talks about a very close friendship, a very good relationship that Rav Yudanasi had with an emperor who's called Antoninos. And uh, there's always some question exactly which Roman emperor was it at the particular time. And some have identified Antoninus with uh, Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was uh, kind of a philosopher emperor. He was someone who was very intellectual, someone who was very interested in ideas. So maybe it makes sense on some level that uh, he would have a shaykhus with Rav Yudha Hanasi. It's not entirely clear. Um, and uh, the Gemara records different discussions that they, different discussions that they had uh, about philosophical issues and also experiential issues because the Gemara gives a story that um, he once ate some delicious food. I guess he gave him cholent, whatever the ancient cholent was, uh, on Shabbos. And Marcus Aurelio said, what is the spice you put into the food? And Rav Yudhanasi said, Shabbos is the spice. So that Shabbos elevates the food. It's not going to taste the same. Right? That's why cholent usually tastes better on Shabbos than, than after Shabbos, the spice, uh, the spice, of, uh, the spice of Shabbos. Um, now, uh, Stoicism, 
well, we use it in modern English too, but uh, we say when somebody is stoic, that means uh, no matter what happens, I don't get upset, I don't expect anything, I don't uh, live uh, for pleasures, I separate myself from pleasures. So we talk about a person as being stoic uh, from, from that idea. And the question is, um, what is the overlap, or is there an overlap between Stoicism and some values in, in Judaism? Uh, the short answer is there is a lot of overlap, but it's also very, very different. Uh, Judaism does advocate a certain amount of separation from the world, an idea of not uh, overindulging in pleasure, of understanding that uh, the ichor of life is uh, developing our relationship with Hashem. Uh, but Stoics, like, like uh, you might assume, are going to a further extreme than I think Judaism would consider desirable. You know, we just had two bishvat. And uh, two bishvat, uh, I don't know if any of you saw the Machina uh, Seder, just magnificent table, beautiful table, wow. So many uh, fruits and colors. And part of the Avaidah of two bishvat is to look at the beauties of Hashem's creation and look at the different tastes and look at the different uh, gifts that Hashem has given us. And instead of rejecting it like a Stoic might, to see the beauty in it and use it to enhance your avodah Hashem. And the Chayvah Salavavas points out uh, that Hashem gives us things that are, that are beyond survival. He could have given us mush to eat. That would keep us alive. Why does he give us tastes and, and aromas and colors and music? Chayvah Salavavas says it's part of the chaste Hashem to give you things that give a person happiness and give a person pleasure. <coughs> <coughs> the Talmud Yerushalmi says, <coughs> this is probably a direct reference to an anti-Stoic statement, that after 120 years, a person will be called to account for every pleasure of this world that he could have enjoyed and he didn't enjoy because he's a kafli taif. Hashem put it here for us to enjoy. So I, I think the difference would be that uh, Stoicism kind of wanted to disengage from the world legomery and uh, Judaism believes that the Nazir is a sinner because he's depriving himself of wine, that you do connect yourself to pleasure, but you do it as a means to be makasher yourself to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, I'm not going to deny that in later Svarim, particularly in Kabbalah, uh, and in certain aspects of Hasidus, certain aspects, other Hasidus is exactly the opposite, uh, there was a very, very strong ascetic idea in which it actually dovetails, it gets closer and closer to Stoicism. Uh, you know, kind of depriving yourself of sleep and, and a lot of fasting and, and all of those in Yonim. Uh, but at least Chazal's view was, was, was not that way. Chazal's view seemed to be a much more balanced view in which you live in harmony with the world instead of looking at the world as something that you, you need to, to avoid. So um, it would be good, to, you know, maybe you can write an article, it would be good to see a, a detailed comparison between Stoicism and, and uh, Judaism. Yeah. Um, in terms of, um, so uh, as a Balshuva, and many of us here, we might have uh, earned money or worked for a few years before going to Sinach or before yeah. uh, doing Shuva, and we haven't given a given Maser, and uh, we've given some amount, but don't know exactly how much, and. Uh, what should we be giving, or what if we? There's no way to find out exactly how much we made and what we, what the our fiuv is. So, so it's it's interesting that uh, first of all, there's a big, big machlokas. Is giving meiser on your salary or on your compensation is that do raisa, or is it drabanan, or is it only a minhag? Meaning there are different sheets ranging from do raisa to a minhag, right? And as a result, the poskim have given us certain leniencies, and they have basically said that if you were not aware of these halachos of Meiser, and you, you, know, you, you weren't giving it, and now you've decided to give it, you don't owe them back taxes, like the IRS telling you, you don't have to pay the back taxes, and you basically do it this way. You take whatever you have right now. Let's imagine you have $5,000 in the bank. So you take 10% of what you have right now, give it as miser, and then the future income that comes in, uh, you take 10% of that, including the interest on the accounts, including other things as well. But you're not mechuyev to recalculate 
all of the salaries that you made and then figure out a bill. That would be a huge difficult problem. I mean, if somebody became a Baal Shuvah, well, it's like a bad tax problem. <laughs> somebody became a Baal Shuvah uh, when they're 45 years old and they were working for 25 years, didn't give you know, much miser. I mean, they may wind up with a bill of like $100,000 or much more than $100,000. So the halacha basically is you start now. You, you start now and mikan haba, you're going to fulfill the mitzvah and be Hashem get brachas from it. Yeah. Uh, in terms of giving my service, is it? Do you give before uh, after taxes? Yeah. So the halacha is that it is after tax income. Again, uh, let me clarify that a little bit. Uh, you do not deduct personal expenses. Otherwise, you, most of us wouldn't give mice at all. Meaning, you don't deduct your food, your rent, your mortgage, your utilities. You know, you got to pay mice on your total income, but the amounts that are required by law to be taken out of your money, even if you're, whether it's deducted as a withholding or whether you pay, that uh, is not part of your income. So therefore, my share is based on after-tax income, but not after-expenses income. The only expenses you can deduct is you can deduct business expenses, meaning to say, uh, if, uh, if I spend money, and that includes you know, commuting to my place of business, if I spent money uh, buying supplies or whatever it would be, I deduct that from my income base, from MICER, because those are the expenses that I spent in earning that money, so that's putter from MICER. And uh, you know, similarly, uh, MICER is on your property. If you had property, if I bought property for $50,000, and I sold it for $60,000. So even though I have $60,000 sitting in my bank account, <coughs> I only pay 10% of the $10,000 profit, not the $50,000 base. So you have to keep a record. When you buy and sell things, you got to keep a record of the cost of, of what you spent. Yeah. Uh, sorry, one last point. Um, what about if you have, you have money invested in stocks? Uh, and like you're getting dividends every so often, do you have to pay MICER on unrealized gains? Yeah, so MICER, again, I don't know how many of you have experience uh, filling out tax returns <laughs> or whatever it is, but the laws of MICER are actually very, very similar in some ways to the laws of income tax. And that is uh, when your stock simply appreciates and you have not received dividend checks, so to speak, so you don't have to pay MICER until you cash out, until you liquidate the stocks, and then you compute your cost, you know, uh, whatever it was, and uh, you pay MICER on the profit. But appreciated property uh, that has not become a cash thing uh, does not have MICER. Same thing with gifts. People often ask a question, am I mechuyev to give MICER on wedding gifts, right? If a couple gets married, uh, hopefully they get a lot of gifts. Uh, do I got to give 10%? So it really depends. If it's a cash gift, I got to give 10% of the cash. Uh, if I got a food processor or, or whatever I got, uh, I'm not mechayif to give miser until I sell it. Meaning you're, you're, miser is based on money, on cash, and there is no chayif miser on things until they're sold. Now in the case of a gift, since you had no cost, if I were to sell my food processor, I would have to pay my 10% of the whole thing I got because there's no cost that, that, that I had. So, um, now, they do tell me a story uh, where it's Mashmer of Yaakov Kamineski was Mashmer on this. Uh, somebody once, uh, he was given a Kiddush for his 80th birthday or something. He was given a very beautiful and expensive Kiddush cup. No, I get back so somebody saw him in a jewelry store that he brought the cup to, uh, to the jeweler because he wanted to know how much it was. So the person was very surprised. I mean, Yaakov wants to know how much the gift was, you know, what's going on. And uh, the explanation that was given is, Rav Yaakov felt he had to pay Meiser 10% of the value of the Kiddush cup. So he needed to know how much the Kiddush cup was worth. Uh, but all I'm saying is, alpi halacha, that would be a chumrah. Alpi halacha, you're not, you're not mechayiv to do that. And that is a difference, by the way, between halacha and IRS. You know, the big problem, uh, I don't know if any of you want to be on Jeopardy or, or a game show or something. Uh, you know, I hope not. Uh, but, you know, uh, you win a prize. 
Now, if you win money, you got to pay taxes. But, but people don't realize, if you win a car, you got to pay taxes. Uh, let's assume I, I get this $100,000 car because I won a contest, right? Wonderful thing. You know, I may have to pay the United States government $30,000 on that car because I got, I got income of $100,000. Now, most people can't afford to pay $30,000. Uh, on a hundred thousand dollar car, so what they're going to do is they're going to sell the car. They're going to pay the taxes anyway, but they, but you know, they they they're left with a little money left over. So in halacha, it wouldn't work that way. In halacha, if you won the hundred thousand dollar car, you wouldn't have to give any miser on it until you sell it, right? So this is uh, we say it's good to be a Jew. Yeah. <laughs> How are we supposed to understand the proverb "One who hates gifts will live long," especially in Judaism, where giving is such a chashev thing? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's a, there's a shver gemara. The gemara in Brachos actually says, if one wants to take gifts, they can do so because that is what Elio Hanavi did. Elio Hanavi traveled and he accepted hospitality. And if one does not want to take gifts, that's also good because that was Shmuel. We had, and as we find among our Nevi'im, two different policies. Shmuel had the idea of never accepting a taiva from anybody. And that's why it says <coughs> that he traveled all over Eretz Yisrael to be a Dayan. He took like his whole house with him all the time. That he would never sleep at somebody's house. He would never take a meal at somebody's house, etc. Eliyahu Hanavi was the opposite. Uh, so there is an idea that you can accept uh, gifts, but but Sonim Atanas uh, basically means that if you are a person who has total emuna in Hashem, you try not to be dependent on the kindness of others. Because when you're too dependent on others, that warps your judgment. You're not able to be courageous when you need to be courageous. You're not able to be objective. You're too beholden to people. And that's kind of a negative thing. However, I want to qualify that. That if you're accepting the gift <coughs> because you know that this would give a lot of pleasure to the other person, then your accepting the gift is actually giving something to them. And that is considered to be legitimate. Uh, I mean, it, hap it happens sometimes. You know, people sometimes want to give you a gift. Uh, and it gives them pleasure. They want to show their respect for you or they want to show their love for you or whatever it would be. So to turn down the gift would hurt their feelings. So at that point, you have to realize that accepting the gift is actually giving them something. In fact, this is even true in Hilchus Kedushin. It's so interesting. In Hilchus Kedushin, the halacha is a man must give the woman something. Right? That's Kedushin. The man gives the woman the ring. If a woman gives the man the ring, that's not Kedushin. In fact, that's even the Shiloh with a double ring ceremony, that where they both, each one gave, you know, not good. But the Gemara says, if the man is an Adam Chashev, so by giving to him, I feel honored that this great man accepted my gift, the woman can give to the man because that's considered to be the man giving the woman the opportunity to honor him by giving him something. Right? So you see that sometimes Receiving a gift can be a form of giving. So, Sani Matanis Yechid does not apply in that case. Yeah. So, uh, do presidents and political leaders nowadays have freedom of, like, free will, or are they like puppets? Yeah, so the question is do presidents or prime ministers or heads of state, <coughs> do they have free will or are they puppets? Again, a little background. Uh, there is, of course, a Pasuk in Mishle, which is the basis of your question, that says, Lev Malachim Visarim Biyat Hashem that the heart of a king or a prince or an officer is in the hands of God, that God determines the decisions. But it's one thing. If I'm a private guy and I make decisions about me, that's free will. I have free will to be good, to be bad. Hashem does not make me go one way or the other. But when my decisions affect a whole nation, Hashem is not going to let my free will simply be the thing that decides, because Hashem has a plan for nations. Hashem has a plan for groups of people. So according to that, it says Hashem directs the particular decisions of, 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 of leaders. So the question becomes, does that principle automatically apply in a modern political state? So it's interesting. Uh, you're raising a good question. Uh, one svara would be 
that the modern head of state is different than the old-fashioned head of state. The old-fashioned head of state was literally a one-man show, was a dictator, was a person who could do whatever he wanted. Today, in a democracy, uh, you have uh, what are called separation of powers, uh, checks and balances. So Hashem can let the president be crazy because there'll be other people who won't be crazy and therefore the president will not be able to get away with things. So it's okay to let him function on the level of Bechira. But I have heard people raise the question, what's the purpose of ever voting for anybody? I mean, if you take the position that Hashem has a plan and Hashem will not let a political leader deviate from Hashem's plan. Lave malachim b'sarim b'yad Hashem. So what's the difference? If I vote for Trump, I vote for Biden, I vote for Netanyahu, or I vote for Naftali Bennett. What's the difference? Hashem has a plan. That plan is going to happen one way or the other. Right? So what are you going to say? Well, this is part of Hashem's hishta- of, of our obligation of Hishtadlis, that even though Hashem has a plan, just like Hashem gives you your parnasa, but your mechuyev, to follow the pathway that normally the derech ha-teva works, so you have two leaders. It may be that the ultimate outcome is going to be the same, but your mechuyev to utilize those particular means. Now, it's still a dochek. I mean, so does that actually mean that election decisions don't change outcomes? Lav davka, because here is the thing. When Hashem gives you a chiyah fishtadlis, Hashem's plan may change based on whether you've done your work or not. Meaning, if I haven't done my work, the plan may change for the worse. But this is subtle. It doesn't change for the worst because the political guy is making the decisions. It changes for the worst because if I was not responsible in my ishtadlis, Hashem changes the decisions that are come. So this is a complicated way of saying that if you don't vote for the right person, there may be negative consequences, but not because the wrong guy is calling the shots, but because Hashem changes the game plan when you didn't do your hishtadlis in a proper, in a proper way. Uh, yeah. Um, so I know that in the founder of Yehuda Nasi, there were already Jews that were in exile from the first temple period. And seemingly they didn't have the same text that Yehuda Nasi had. They were not the same what? The same? The same text that yes. Yehuda Nasi had authored. My question is, is, did they, is, are you aware of anyone that ended up creating their own form of the Talmud? And if, so, and if they didn't, then how were they able to possibly, like, I mean, according to Yehuda Nasi, they were going to forget everything, so how would they possibly maintain anything? Yeah, so, so I'm not aware of, of any alternative, well, well let me put it this way. The Gemara itself says that there were Tanoim before Rav Yudah Hanasi that had their own collections of Mishnayas. But that was in Eretz Yisrael. And Rav Yudah Hanasi drew upon them in making the Mishnah. But if you're asking me, were there communities in Chutz Laris that had their own version of Torah Shabbal uh, that I'm not, I'm not aware of. Uh, and it could very well be exactly what happens is what Rav Yudah Hanasi was afraid of, that they were separated and they forgot they just didn't have it. For example, um, a later example, the Ethiopian Jews, who probably were and are halachically Jewish, but for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, they had no connection to Torah Shabbal Peh. They developed their own rituals, their own things. That could have happened in those (coughs) communities. Now, in the time of the Amorayim, we do have that experience, and that's exactly the Talmud Yerushalmi. The Talmud Yerushalmi developed independently from the Talmud Bavli. And uh, maybe we'll get to it eventually. Uh, when the Talmud Bavli was finally written down in the time of Ravina and Ravashi, and it was sent to Eretz Yisrael, there were many groups in Eretz Yisrael that did not want to accept it at all. The Gainim had to work for like 200 years to secure the acceptance of the Talmud Bavli. And some of it was very, very uh, acrimonious. Uh, in fact, uh, they say the following. How old is the uh, community of Ashkenazic Jews in Germany? In fact, Ashkenaz means Germany. Right, Worms, all those old cities. According to some Machiris, there were Jews in Germany from the time of the Chorban Bayes Rishon, before the Mishnah, Chorban Bayes Rishon. 
And it turned out that they developed different minhagim that were connected what eventually was in the, at least the Gemara. I didn't hear it against the Mishnah. And when they were told, why don't you accept the Gemara? Their answer was, our minhagim are older than your Gemara. Our minhagim are older than you. Why do we have to change our minhagim? These were our minhagim. We had our rabbis. So there was such a thing in a limited context. But I, I don't think you know, we had a whole Mishnah or anything, anything like that. Well, okay, yeah, the question is, is it possible for a Kiddush Hashem to come through a non-religious Jew, especially if the Kiddush Hashem involves a violation of the halacha? So the first question, Stamaz, I think is fairly simple. Certainly, Hashem can use anyone to do a Kiddush Hashem. And even a non-religious Jew could, could be a kind person, could be a gracious person, and that could be a Kiddush Hashem. Uh, the question is more, much more difficult if the action that is Makade Shem Shemayim is sinful in the eyes of God? Um, that's a very tough question. I mean, on one hand, I could understand how that could be the case. But on the other hand, I have a great deal of difficulty that something that is violating the will of Hashem can be a source of glorifying His name. Because what does Kiddush Hashem ultimately mean? You have glorified the name of Hashem. How can you glorify the name of Hashem by doing something that Hashem doesn't want you to do? So I, I think there would be some difficulties in, in that idea. But the, fa the mere fact that he's not religious, that, that would not take away Kiddush Hashem potential. Yeah? Um, forgive me, I can't remember the name of the Rishon, but I've, I've heard of a story of a Rishon that he had, I believe he had, at least he had a name, Akiva, in his name. And he was uncertain of like, whether the last letter of his name Akiva was it a hay or an olive? Yep. And he had like a door or something. Could, could the Rub expand about that and how, based off of a, like, so to speak, like a vision, he was able to like paskin? Well, that? you know, I don't remember the story. I mean, I mean, I mean, all I can tell you is this it's Machlokis the Bavli and the Yushalmi. <laughs> the Talmud Yushalmi spells Akiva with a hay, and the Talmud Bavli spells Akiva with an olive. No, I, I'll try to look up the story. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure about that story, but that would be the machlokas, the Babi and the Yushalmi. Now, normally, although this is not a matter of halacha, well, actually, it could be a matter of halacha. How do you write it in a get? A get, you have to be very careful in how you spell names. Uh, normally, we possibly like the Babi, Keneged, the Keneged, the Yushalmi. On the other hand, I think I mentioned to you that the Rambam himself had a shita that sometimes he would paskin like the Yushalmi over the Babli. So that might be the issue of the, the uncertainty here. Yeah. To prepare for the questions <coughs> that will be asked when one arrives in Shemayim, yeah. what are some practical ways that one can work on their anticipation of Mashiach? Um, yeah. Uh, this is a question, right? We talked about the six questions Hashem is going to ask us. And one of those questions is, did you eagerly yearn and wait for the coming of Mashiach? So the question becomes, uh, how can I prepare myself for that? I believe in Mashiach. It's a, yeah, okay, in a but you know, yearning for Mashiach. So the truth of the matter is, this is where learning about Mashiach can really help you, because I think the problem we all have is we just have a vague idea of what it means, right? So it doesn't really move us because uh, it doesn't mean anything concrete. So the more you study about what the world will be like when Mashiach comes. And then the more you realize how far we are from that vision, then it becomes something that you could hopefully yearn for and await. So I would think that probably the easiest thing or the most direct thing to do would be try to learn the specifics of Mashiach. And that type of learning will be ma'ayrer e cheshek. Because the more we can picture something, the more we can have a sense of, of what it might be like, we'll never have a complete picture, the more I can hope for it and, and yearn for it. So uh, that would be something to work on. Yeah? Um, if we have uh, Yerides Burroughs... I didn't hear you say it. If we have Yerides Burroughs... Yeah. Um, in terms of bringing Mashiach, how can we be misogyny with the previous Burroughs? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's again a very excellent question. Uh, we're, we're inferior to the earlier generations. I mentioned the Gemara in Erevin that if the first generations are uh, angels, we are like people. If the first generations are people, we are like donkeys, and we're not even the donkey of Pinchas Ben Yoyer. We're worse than that donkey. 
Uh, so the question is, if the Tanoim, the Amoraim, you know, couldn't bring Mashiach, how is it Shaykh for us who are by definition so much lower? How could our deeds bring Mashiach? So there are two answers to it. One answer is that it's not we who are bringing Mashiach, it's the accumulation of all of the Dairis. So let's imagine <coughs> that you have to climb a wall. To get to Mashiach, you got to climb a wall that's you know, 10,000 feet high. So the previous generations already brought us up to 9,999. It's not that we're bringing Mashiach. We just have to get over the other six inches that are left. And it's the collective zechus of Am Yisrael over all of the dairei dairis that are going to bring Mashiach. Right? So that, that's a, the simplest answer, really. Uh, that it's not us that are bringing it, it's the accumulation of everybody else. And they did most of the work, frankly. They did 99.9% .9 of the work, so we have to do the little bit that is left. That's one idea. The second idea, uh, the Chavitz Chaim says, and that is, Hashem evaluates us based on a handicap, so to speak, just as you might uh, give you know, extra credit to, to somebody that has uh, a learning disability in whatever it would be, give them more time or whatever it is. And that is, spiritually, we don't have the kaiches of the earlier generations. We are weaker, we're not as understanding. But that actually means that even though we do less and we accomplish less, possibly in Hashem's book, it may count for more. You don't know. Uh, and therefore, uh, Chavis Chaim used to say that uh, the learning that somebody does today counts more than the learning that somebody did when they were in a Saviva of Aliyah and Ruchnius and the like. I, I think I once uh, told you guys of a story that um, I was uh, at an NCSY Shabbaton years ago, and you know, Motzi Shabbos, they have a kumzitz, and uh, kids get up and tell their stories. So there was a, a girl, a 14-year-old girl, who told a story that her parents uh, not only are not Shomer Shabbos, but they don't let her keep Shabbos. So what she does, 11 o'clock at night, after Friday night, after her parents are asleep, she goes into the bathroom and she lights Shabbos candles with a bracha, and then she blows them out and she turns on the fan to get rid of the smoke. Now, you could give a smicha test on how many sins did she commit there. <laughs> uh, you, you know, like it's like 100 averas, right? And still, and still, you know, her kavana was so sincere. Yeah. I don't know how Hashem is going to judge it, but you know, it could, Hashem has a standard of judgment that's very different than us. Hashem looks at a person's heart. Hashem looks at a person's motivation. Hashem looks at a person's struggles. And Bechi Gavne, therefore, Chavitz Chaim says, we have a certain advantage. The fact that we live in such a door of pritzas and the fact that, that we still try to serve Hashem even though it's so not easy in this generation, you know, so that, that's why we might be able to do something that an earlier generation could not do. So those are the two terutes, I think, that, that we have. Yeah. <coughs> well, the truth of the matter is, uh, in the time of the Amirayim, uh, the truth is, I, you have a fairly simple answer, and that is, the persecution in Eretz Yisrael was so severe that it kemat was not shayach to learn Torah. And Memela, in such a situation, it's a Dover Pashat, better to be in Bavel than Eretz Yisrael, because in Eretz Yisrael, you simply were almost not able to learn Torah. The Yishuv of Eretz Yisrael was almost totally destroyed. I think I mentioned that one of the reasons they say the Talmud Yushalmi is harder to learn than the Bavli, it was written under such extreme conditions that got worse after the Talmud Yushalmi was finished, that it was never shy to, to really write it out and explain things and the like. So in the time of the Amirayim, uh, it does make sense that, I mean, imagine, I mean, I'll give you an extreme example. You know, Hitler, Yimach Shemo, was on the verge of actually conquering uh, Eretz Yisrael. Uh, that's the whole story. I mean, uh, Rommel was going to, you know, going to move into the Middle East and uh, take over. Now, let's imagine, chas v'shalom, this, this should never, never, ever happen. Let's imagine Hitler uh, conquered Eretz Israel, right? So, <laughs> if I'm living in America, you know, am I supposed to, like, 
trying to make Aliyah to live in Eretz Yisrael, you know, we, we, would, we, would not, we would not recommend that, right? That, that would not be where you go. Now, uh, the, now Eino Daima today, t- so today is the opposite. Today, Baruch Hashem, uh, you know, Eretz Yisrael, uh, you know, you can learn, you have so many places to learn, so much Taira. So to, to make a dimian from what they did in the time of the Gemara, Bechlau would not, would not make a lot of sense. Nevertheless, it's still Emes that so many G'daylim still live in Chutz Laaretz, so many Talmud Chachamim live in Chutz Laaretz, and it's a bit of a kasha, right? So why, why aren't everybody in Lakewood? Why isn't Lakewood here? Right? Why isn't Borough Park here? You know? Um, that, that, that's, a good, that's a good question. That is, that is a very good question. And the Kuzari, the Kuzari, uh, the king of the Khazars, asks the Chaver, the rabbi of the Kuzari, Vidal Levi, he says, hey, you Jews pray three times a day to go back to Eretz Yisrael. How come you don't go back? <coughs> and the Chaver answers, this is our shame, Melech, <coughs> that we keep on asking Hashem for the, for the right to go back, and then we don't do it. It's like the Tzitzuf, Twittering, this is before there was Twitter, the Twittering of birds. Mm-hmm. Now, in those days, that was the, like, the, one, the year 1000, going back to Eretz Yisrael was an extreme hardship, an afilu hachi, the Chavra gave Musr to Klau Yisrael. So today it's a difficult question. Well, in time of the Tanoim, uh, there weren't that many Tanoim in Babel. Uh, the Tanoim are from Eretz Yisrael. I mean, there was Nochem HaBavli, I mean, there were a few, but for sure. Uh, the vast majority of Tanoim lived in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, I mean, it was a bad time then too, but but it wasn't as bad, and they lived in Eretz Yisrael. Yeah. Yeah. So we know that uh, the Chavetz Chaim had a very strong longing for it to go to Eretz Yisrael. Yeah. And uh, but however, at the same time, he had a tremendous like following of Talmudim and like, people that like, wanted they were looking for his guidance. And one of the ideas is that if you're like if you're like a Rava community, you shouldn't be leaving there to go to Eretz Yisrael. So. How do, you, how do you understand that with his longing? No, no, that, that's exactly correct. Uh, you know, when, when Chavitz Chaim wanted to go to Eretz Yisrael, he was already an older man, he was in his 80s, and uh, Rav Chaim Eiser, who was the, the Paisa Kador, got a whole bunch of G'daylem to go to the Chavitz Chaim and beg him, beg him not to leave. They say, we need you. And in those days, you didn't have email, and you know, it wasn't so easy to communicate. Certainly didn't have Zoom uh, and, and, and the like. Now, the Chavitz Chaim was going to go anyway. He was going to go anyway. But what happened was, the day he was supposed to go, uh, his wife broke her leg. And uh, she was uh, not well for, for like six months. And by the end of the six months, he was too sick to go. So it's been a Shemayim. They didn't let him, let him go. But as a practical matter, as a practical matter, you are correct. This is a very big issue. If you're a Rav, you're a Marbitz Torah, there is a big cheshman, and that is, I want to make Aliyah, but maybe I have an achrayas to my community. <coughs> now, you have to be modest, right? I mean, I mean, listen, listen, I, mean I, I myself uh, had to grapple with it a little bit. I was a rub of a shul, right? But you have to be modest. You know, I know every rabbi likes to feel, oh, if I leave, that's the end of the shul, end of the community. You know, how can I leave? Okay, you have to be modest. You have to be realistic. You know, okay, they'll, they'll survive. Usually they'll survive. But... There are kehilas where they will not survive. There are, there are sometimes situations where somebody is so indispensable to keep something going that they shouldn't. They have enough rice. The Ramban, people ask the Kasha. The Ramban Badafka is the one that holds Yishav Eret Yisrael is a mitzvah the Arisa. That's the Ramban. The Rambam says it's not. And the Ramban did not go to Eret Yisrael until he was kicked out. What happened was he debated a priest and uh, he won the debate. That's the good news. The bad news is, if you win the debate against the priest, we kick you out of the country. <laughs> the good news is that he finally used that excuse to come to Eretz Yisrael. But he didn't go until he was kicked out. How could that be? How could the Ramban not go to, if the Ramban holds it's a mitzvah de Oraisa to live in Eretz Yisrael? How could the Ramban not go? So we don't know exactly. The Ramban doesn't tell us why he didn't go earlier. But one of the explanations is he was the, the Godel Hador and the Jews were in Europe. The Mela, they, he needed to be uh, near them. Right? So there is a concept that uh, for the Tzarech of the Rabbim, you, you, you're Mavatar on your own particular Chiv. And uh, the Chavitz Chaim held that because there were G'dayla Makrav Chaim Eiser, he wasn't so necessary, you know, that, that type of situation. But that was the Machlokas, yeah. 
What's stopping anyone today from becoming as Kabbalistically, you know, attuned as the Arizal, for example? Like, learning enough Zohar or learning enough separate Eritrea to do the things that are needed or to be able to, you know, uh, you know, understand Gilgalim or understand all these really very Kabbalistic things that we otherwise might not understand. So is there anything that stops somebody? Why can't there be another, another Arizal? The truth is, I'm, I'm not going to say it's impossible, just like could there be another Vilna Gaon in, 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 in the revealed portion of the Torah. Theoretically, it's possible. I think it's going to be extremely unlikely, simply because, once again, we go with the pattern that as the Doros get further from our Sinai, the Doros get spiritually weaker. And also, as I mentioned earlier, the tuma in the world also affects us in different ways. And the world's getting very, very decadent in so many ways. I mean, it was always decadent, but you know, it's, it's kind of worse. And that drags you, drags you down uh, and, uh, and, and the like. So um, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I think it would be unlikely. But an example, let me tell you the Ramchal. The Ramchal is a, is a very good example. Uh, the Ramchal... Uh, well, he was after the Ariba, but not only that, the Ramchal actually was in the, in the process of writing a new Zohar. Not a commentary on the Zohar. He wrote commentaries on the Zohar. He was writing a Zohar, meaning direct revelations from HaKadosh Baruch And uh, I think he burned it largely, so we don't have it. But you see an example of someone who was reaching, in other words, he wasn't explaining what somebody else heard from HaKadosh Baruch Elio and Avi. He was explaining things that directly went to him. So I think the Ramchal was someone that was mamish. Uh, I, I can't say he was the Madrega of Shimon Bar Yochai, but he was doing something very similar to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. <coughs> so it is possible, but I say un unlikely. Okay, uh, one more, yeah. We say one lesson is don't go to law school. No, <laughs> we did. That, might, that might be MS. Uh, well, I tell you what. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, have, I have to be careful because I don't want to encourage people to dafka to pursue uh, secular pursuits if they otherwise, you know, are inclined not to do it. You know, tavo, tavo bracha. But I think uh, a lot of the way we learn things is by comparing them to other things. Uh, in other words, you learn an idea, then you see how, an, how this idea plays out somewhere else, you understand. I remember throughout law school, I, I constantly had this experience when I learned something in law, I said, oh, that's what the Gemara means. Oh, okay, now I get it. And, I, you know, and it happens that way. There, there is what is called a cross-fertilization. Of, uh, because again, you have to know that although the Gemara, you know, is, is ruchnius and the Gemara is based on Torah and the Torah is based on Hakadosh Baruch Hu giving Moshe the 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 Torah of Bichsav, the Torah of Balpe, and it's Kadosh and it's not changeable, very different than a legal system. But the reasoning, I mean, the Gemara is a legal work. Putting aside Agadita, it's a legal analysis. You're looking at precedent. You're looking at earlier cases. You're drawing analogies. You're making differences. This is what is called in the secular world legal reasoning. Now, of course, Tyra is based on different presuppositions. That, that, that is true. But the process of reasoning is the same. So law in particular can help a person uh, understand Gemara a little better. So this would be less true. Well, I mean, every discipline in its own way. I mean, literature could give you a Havana of Agatha, you know, different ways, kind of a more symbolic type of thinking. Uh, law can give you an appreciation of how to analyze halacha. Now, I, I've said many times already in my conversation with Yaakov Kamenetsky, you know, and I, I spoke to him. In fact, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this. I have mentioned all the time I spoke to him about a personal issue. So I'll tell you now, the personal issue was, should I go to law school? That, that exactly, I think this may be the first time I mentioned this. That was the issue I spoke to him about. And he didn't answer me. And he was just making me, do you think about this, think about this, think about this. And the maskana is a very important maskana. He says, whatever you do is up to you. I'm not going to tell you. But whatever you do, you have to use it in Avodah session. You can't create this is your secular life, and this is your religious life. You have to take the secular and use it in a way that helps you 
in your Avedis Hashem. And those are very, very wise, uh, wise words to think about.